Hey guys, it's Archie. I'm back for the uh, another special edition of the ADHD uh, Care Podcast. And uh, we've got a special guest uh, on today's uh, special edition of today's um, podcast. I've got Karen Keane and Katrion Hassel. So Katrion is joining us via uh, Zoom, uh, virtually. I'm sure some of you streaming, um, watching us live on our social media platforms can see uh, Katrion on our big screen just over there. And uh, in, in, the, in the studio today, as I said, I've got Karen Keane. So um, I'll let um, Karen do her own introductions. But the main emphasis of today's podcast is to focus on all things uh, ed- um, education particularly given the time of the season that we are in at the moment, given that we've got exams coming up in the next few weeks and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of students out there and young people are busy preparing, revising for their exams. So I thought we could dedicate today's podcast uh, and uh, yeah, just to discuss about, you know, give some, you know, find out from Karen and Katriona what will be helpful, get them to maybe outline some helpful tips for, for the young person for students and also for parents as well, trying to support their children, uh, particularly this stressful time that we're in. So first of all, Karen, welcome. Hi. Um, So I am a Senko and I've worked closely with, I've been one for um, 10 plus years and I work closely with Catriona actually, um, supporting young people with a variety of um, difficulties or challenges, so ASD, ADHD, um, amongst others um, so yeah that's that's me I work in a local independent school but I also do some consultancy work for um, a couple of the state schools locally as well excellent perfect glad to have you Karen uh, I know we, of course we've met a few times and uh, you were um, you featured with your daughter last um, the last podcast we did with Molly so glad to have you back and uh, Katriona do you want to introduce yourself Hi, uh, my name is Katrina Hassel. I'm a consultant psychologist. I uh, specialise in working with students with ADHD and autism um, and um, supporting them at home and at school. Um, I've been a psychologist for far too long. Um, I started out in as a trauma, uh, being my background was in trauma and ended up uh, in education, as one does. Amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Again, once again, uh, glad to have you, Katriona. And uh, of course, I've known Katriona for some time as well. So um, it'd be nice to just find out from both of you to, in, in terms of, like, as I said, just in uh, this topic that we want to discuss today around education. And just to find out from yourself, just from your experience, how, you know, any information that you have that we can obviously share with our, our clients and our listeners, that would be very helpful. We've had some questions coming through as well. So I'll be throwing those questions to you guys and getting you to. Um, to maybe gen- generate a discussion with um, as we as we go along, and we'll be if anyone out there who's watching this live stream wants to um, leave any comments or has any uh, burning questions, feel free to uh, to drop them in our comment box. If you're on Facebook, we are streaming live over there, so just either drop us a, a personal message or leave them in the comment box under this live stream. Uh, once again, we are live on Twitter. Um, you can do the same thing. You can drop us a message over there. We are not streaming live on Instagram today, so we are only live on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, and on our Twitter page. So I don't know where to start with this topic. <laughs> so we are, yeah, April exams are coming up. I'm seeing young people day in, day out, particularly those um, young people who are about to take their GCSEs and A levels. So if I could maybe start with you, Karen. Um, yeah, so. It, this is obviously a stressful time for any student um, um, you know the revision and everything that they've been doing over, over, over the years and stuff it's, it's coming down to this period that we're in so what what do you think will be quite a good start kind of a, for us to have a, a discussion around this I think I, I hope Catherine will agree with me. I think there's probably a couple of things really as a parent um, I said last week I think you know pick your battles decide what is important um, and have a discussion with your young person about what help they might need. Um, they might revise very differently, actually, if they're, you know, slightly more, um, or if, the, if their learning style is different to you, they may have a very different way of learning, as I found out last year. And I think the biggest thing to say is this is the first year for lots of kids doing A-levels, particularly, is their first year of sitting public exams. So there will be an enormous amount of apprehension I'd rather call it that than anxiety and I guess it's about normalizing some of that as well and saying actually you know these are big deals these are um, exams this is your first series of exams and and you are going to feel it's it's normal to feel a certain amount of and as I say I keep using the word apprehension rather than anxiety just to make the difference that some of it is actually quite normal and some of it we need in order to be able to perform in the exams Um, and Catriona have you got anything you want to throw in 
I always think with that, with this, you know, notion that students ought, should, could, must be able to revise umpteen hours a day. Um, and the, generally the way they revise can be, um, I always say they need to revise, revise smarter, not harder, but just smarter. And, and I think, you know, it's that notion, and I spend a lot of time talking about this at the moment, is that they still need that little dopamine hit. So you've got to fact in something that's going to give them a happy dopamine hit into your day as part of your revision plan. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, music breaks or um, sports breaks, you know, but you've got to factor that into your day. Um, the other thing is, you know, all this, they should be able to do this. They just can't break it down. Um, and we've been doing loads of work on those big A2 sheets that have kind of got days of the week and then just writing in each day what they're going to do and when, um, just so that they can cross it off as they go. So I think a lot of the time as, as a parent, you'd, you know, yes, ask them what they need, but they really need help with organisation. Um, my last slightly bonkers point is, is most of the students I work with have processing problem, you know, classic ADHD processing problem. And again, moving while you're learning. So in you know, ask some questions, flashcards, while they're moving or just talking to them about it, but let them move to work. Sitting at a desk is just going to be very unhelpful. And and for a young person who struggles with getting started, getting motivated to tackle like, all kind of academic tasks, revision and things like that, uh, Katriona, what, what tips would you have for them? I always start this conversation. I'm asked this all the time. Um, you have to onboard. You know, and whatever helps them on board. So it's always like get the little space sorted, organized and have the same routine. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of put all your pens out and get your cup of tea, whatever you do, just make sure you go through that routine so you actually get started. And it's just like writing an essay. You might need help to start actually start. And again, a parent prompting or just saying, well, let's start with this bit. You know, it, it's going to help them actually start and not right reading it through and taking notes and then taking notes from your notes because by the time you've read it twice you're bored of it so you know i often say watch a youtube video you know help them make a flash card anything that you can do that is not the same repetitive activity because it is unbelievably i've done it it's unbelievably boring so i'll often say start by watching a youtube video and then go and chat to someone about it but there are different ways you can revise. It does not mean sitting at your desk eight hours a day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I like the point about the dopamine hit that you mentioned there. But I think it's all about in moderation as well, because sometimes, you know, too much dopamine is not good for you. And you can get <laughs> carried away by, you know, you know that, that dopamine seeking kind of type sort of behaviours that we see in some young people with ADHD. So knowing, you know, I can only do this for this amount of time um, and then coming back to the task that can be a challenge isn't it once you find that you've kind of taken away from you know whatever you were doing and you've lost that momentum to then pick up from where you left off I'm sure you, 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 you see that quite or you hear that quite a lot I do so I always say you you do your sessions you know and I always say 15 45 minutes and 15 minutes off um, and I always say your last session of the day is your dopamine hit so it's your run it's your go play music but it is your last session of the day so that you don't get that distraction in the middle of the day. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Something to look forward to, doesn't it? It's, it's all. I think the biggest thing is the planning. I think looking back and talking to Molly last week, the biggest thing was how she sat down. I think she said to us, didn't she, that she actually the physicality of having the big because you and I were talking about apps and things like that. She said none of that worked. Actually, having a big sheet of paper and writing stuff on it absolutely helped to make it concrete. And not doing two weeks in advance, just doing a day or two days at a time more than enough so I think that's a you know as a parent you do want to help them obviously but actually I think certainly from Molly's experience the practical help was probably more useful than me hovering over her or trying to test her on stuff it was you know here's the post-its here's the whatever here's the giant bit of paper that was really really helpful and I think the other thing I did touch on was having spare sets of everything all over the place in the car at granny's it really doesn't matter so you kind of cut down anything you can do to practically cut down on the stress levels um, pre-exam really 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 helpful and really powerful but I think the first thing is to get them organized and like you say get a routine going and it's it's once you've got the routine it's it's so much easier it flows quite naturally and quite organically I, would you agree I mean I think it's those those slightly kind of creative things like the post-it notes you can now get absolutely oh, what's my dog's barking now um you can absolutely get massive uh, post-it notes now um, you can get whiteboard materials that are a wallpaper. So you can literally pin it up and down and they can write all over it. Glass pens on your windows. You know, 
anything like that. It just it, it makes it a bit more creative and a bit more exciting yeah. than you um, writing on a piece of paper. And, you know, and I think it is that they're standing up. You put your whiteboard paper up on the wall and they're just writing all over your wall. Um, my glass windows were written all over with a glass pen that you can wipe off. Just make it exciting because it is so dull. Yeah. To pull the curtains as well and then come back in and test yourself afterwards. So you can write stuff yeah. up day one and wipe it off or do whatever you need to do. And it is the physicality, the moving around is the big bit, moving around to get stuff in there. Mm. Um, yeah, and it, I think it's all about moving. You know, all these kids, are, you know, the processing problem, it just seems to go in much more easily if you can move mm. and you don't get it in a room, in the same room. The other thing I recommend is changing rooms because the same room all the time, I mean, I have ADHD, it would drive me nuts. So, you know, I would always say, if that drives you nuts, move room all the time as well, because then you feel you're somewhere fresh. Yeah. And, and and I know some young people I, I speak to, they like to have some sort of background noise and, um, you know, whether it's music or some, like, white noise or something. <laughs> is is that something that you also hear? And is that something quite useful as well to, to kind of consider as a parent to think because sometimes if you're the parent and you hear a young person playing music whilst they're trying to revise you might feel like they're not concentrating they're not actually revising <laughs> they should be like in silence but it's worth obviously making a note that you know some background noise for some young people is also quite useful well, there's a lot of research to suggest that some form of white noise or brown noise is really helpful um certainly our experience has been that where they can have something um, it's been really helpful and it helps them to hype, it helps with that hyper focus as well on the, on the actually yeah. contrary to popular belief it actually helps <laughs> the, the hyper focus on the actual task it's it's about you know some pretty hardcore music seems to really help them mm. not your lovely little Mozart playing in the background but I mean yeah, I read yeah. an article metal and ADHD the other day you know so that is their kind of preferred chart and I was astounded but you know I do think it is it's so important and you know if you're a parent and you don't have ADHD it's very difficult to kind of imagine what it's like to have it and so you're trying to kind of give all these rules but actually they're not going to be helpful hmm. that, that, that is a point that you've raised there as a parent you, you you know you yourself having ADHD and then having to then try and support a young person with ADHD so for both of you obviously you mentioned about your, your own journey with ADHD so if I start with well, let me start with Karen, actually. So if you maybe just tell us a bit about that, actually, just, um, you know, how you, you became what you are working in this field of, you know, um, diversity, particularly in education. You've got a long history working as a special educational needs coordinator, as you said in your introduction. I think it probably helps. Uh, Catherine and I often joke that um, we can spot the other fellow ADHDers in a room, can't we? <laughs> Before they even speak, we kind of gravitate towards one another. And I think actually it's quite interesting because watch kids in a, in a group and the neurodiverse children do tend to sort of gravitate towards one another, possibly because they're, they're maybe part of their, their sort of um, diversity is that they are more open to... Um, other people's idiosyncrasies in a way that perhaps neurotypical people don't don't see or don't empathise with. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's that. I am what I am. I'm bonkers. There are times myself and Catherine I know can talk 100 miles an hour. We we are you know there's a rabbit out the window, whatever it might be, and then straight back to being serious. So it, you know it <laughs> it has its pluses, doesn't it? Um, but we also get each other, so that's quite handy when we're, when we're working. And I think most importantly, the young people feel that actually, whilst we may be slightly nuts, um, we are actually, we get them. And that's the really important thing, that they actually feel they're talking to an adult who empathises, understands, and can actually give them really sensible, sound advice that, that suits them as a learner. Not, not mum and dad, but suits them with their ADHD or ADD profile and I think that's really really important for young people to feel that actually there's an adult who gets them and that their way of being is not abnormal it's just a different way of being how do you how, sorry how do you find um raising a young person with ADHD when you have ADHD yourself Karen uh challenging uh, yeah. as does Katrina I'm sure um I think the hardest thing is and certainly around exams and stuff like that, managing this apprehension slash anxiety and the point at which it tips into anxiety. I think I said last week, I'm cup half full, she's cup half empty. And that can be really hard to manage at times because yeah. I am blissfully unaware of the fact that, you know, my cup half full is probably really, really irritating to somebody who would just like to wallow for five minutes. 
Um, and we had the example of talking about the, the, you know, the, the driving lessons and stuff like that. So allowing the young person their five minutes of wallowing and then saying, OK, you've had your five minutes wallow, let's move on now, please. Um, and, and accepting. The other big thing as a parent is, is, and it's really hard to do when they've got exams, step back and allow them to tell you what they need rather than you dictating what you think they need. Um, and again, I think a, kids with ADHD or ADD w would be the first to say that's the most helpful bit of advice for their parents to actually say, um, what do you need from me? Do you just want me to hear you? Do you want me to do something about it? Um, and, and allowing them to develop their own sense of independence and their own little route to that independence. Leaning on you a bit, but actually um, just being there in the background, not helicoptering. And that's really hard to do because you, you as an adult, know what's coming at the end of it. You know that, you know, jobs may be won or lost on the on the strength of an exam grade, but you have to just take a deep breath and say, okay, it's their journey, not mine. And that's the hardest bit when you know yeah. what's at stake. Of course, yeah. Um, Katriona, if I if I come to you, same question. Just uh, you know, being an adult, um, certainly working in the field that you work in as well, and also living with ADHD, and then having to raise children with ADHD. What's that like? I think I mean chaotic. Um, we're all bonkers. Um, we all have hyperactive type ADHD. So you know, three tickers in a room together is a fun place to be. Um, I think two things, though. I think, number one, my children can't get anything past me. You know, my daughter will kind of say, oh, I can't do that. You know, I'm so lastminute.com. Everyone with ADHD is lastminute.com. I'm the most organized person you'll ever meet. My things are done the day I, they arrive. You know, and I've, I've had to learn that. But I was like, no, that's not true because I'm super organized. That's learned organization. It wasn't, you know, inherent in me. I also think it, it's the howlers that I've, I'm going to be very honest, that I've made because especially with my son, who Karen knows well, I really struggled at school, like really struggled at school, but uni was easy. And so I gave him loads and loads of support at school because obviously I'd found it so hard, but it was a super structured school. He went to university and fell apart because there was no system or structure there. So I think it's, if you have ADHD, it's realizing your child's is very different to yours and you've got to listen to them and you've got to look at them and what's yours like, because it's not the same as mine. Mm. You know, there are little traits that I get. We all eat with tiny spoons, you know, it's hilarious, but those little traits are funny, but a lot of things, they're totally different. And, and I think it's, it's actually, yeah, stopping and listening and what do you need from me? Um, and accepting that we just live in, in chaos, you know, I mean, someone's going out for a run when, you know, somebody else wants a really quiet space because they've got sensory overload. So, um, yeah, welcome to my house. Two cats and a dog, all mad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, did you get the diagnosis after your children got diagnosed or was it, uh, I don't know, at what point in your life were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed age 42. Um, both my children were diagnosed by then. I was suffering with, I would say, extraordinary high levels of anxiety. I suddenly started having really bad panic attacks. Um, went to see the psychiatrist who told me I was bipolar, by the way. Uh, and because I'm a professional, I kind of sat there going, but I'm never unhappy. I'm never low. I wake up happy. I get happier. I go back to happy. I'm kind of irritating, um, just like Karen said for her child, because I am Mrs. Glass half full, always. Um, and went to see him and then went back to him, you know, a month later and said, I, how can I be? Um I don't have this in my family. Did it, my, my kids have ADHD? And he was like, oh, maybe you have ADHD then. And that was my diagnosis. I tried meds. They worked. Um, I don't take meds now, but that's how I got diagnosed. Wow. Coming from this extremely academic family, by the way, and I left school at 16. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, we spoke before. You, you said you were tried on medication for a while after your diagnosis? I took medication just, yeah, for about yeah. three or four weeks. Um, you know, thought it was fantastic, but realised I was used to my slightly ad hoc way of living. You know, I like to get up and hoover at 5.30 in the morning just to make sure everyone's awake. Yeah. So it's kind of hard then to change at 42. Yeah. Um, and yeah. suddenly be able to focus because I taught myself to focus and I taught myself to do all these things. So I realised meds were not for me, but both my children take them. So I'm not anti-meds or anything. It just, it wasn't for me. Yeah, of course. And and um, I think you had, you went down the talking therapy side route didn't you i, I did yeah. <laughs> in psychotherapy i am a yeah. qualified psych well but i had intensive psychotherapy yeah. which was just because i understood where all my behaviors were coming from mm. um so i 
and, I mean, and again, psychotherapy is not for everybody, but it happened to work really well for me. Mm. Um, w- one thing I'll, I, 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 you know, um, I often kind of come across is like, given that your background, you work in education psychology. Um, how do you differentiate between like if you come across a young person with maybe some learning difficulties or like processing issues and stuff? Where, how do you kind of differentiate between uh, possible ADHD and some possible learning issue there? Oh, you're going to have my mad theory. Um, <laughs> I, I see probably on a weekly basis, half the clients I see will come in with a dyslexia diagnosis. Right. And what I'm seeing more and more and more is, of course, the way we teach reading is, is via phonics nowadays. And to remember all the English phonics, of which there are an awful lot, you have to have an amazing working memory, which most of our ADHD kids do not have. And you have to be able to focus, which they aren't able to do. So I'm seeing patterns of what looks like dyslexia when they're little. By the time they're 12, 13, 14, their literacy skills have all picked up. They're amazing. But they have this dyslexia diagnosis, which is meant to be this lifelong condition. But their working memory and processing speed is shocking. Uh, they tend to have very, very poor um, handwriting and hypermobility issues. And then you start unpicking the executive functions. And you realise there's no dyslexia there. There never has been, but th- boy, do they have ADHD. Wow. I think we lost Cacciola there for a sec. <laughs> Oops. Hang on. Hello. Hello. Are you still there? Uh, yes. All oh, right. Okay. So we, we seem to have lost you, you on yes. our. You frozen on our. Yeah. One second. Let me <laughs> see what's going on. Let me end it over to Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Just for a second while you saw that. Yeah. yeah. I think the same thing, I think the same sort of things as Katrina, the, it's, it's funny because listening to her talk, it resonates with me. Chaos at home, but actually supremely organised, ruthlessly organised at work, um, which my family, my parents, etc., would not possibly believe of me. Um, but that's the joys of, of, you know, never actually growing up in your parents' eyes. Mm. Um <laughs> Oh, have we got her back now? No, no, not yet. That's, not yet. that's only you. Oh, it's only me. <laughs> that's, that's your twin. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, the, the whole thing with, with the learning difficulties, I'm, I certainly see more and more in school, and particularly Catriona would, would um, agree with me, we're seeing more and more young ladies who have not been picked up early enough in school. Yeah. Um, and there is some research to suggest that there's, there's, there's hormonal links with the ADHD and the onset or the, the growth of the symptoms or the, the sort of speed at which they become apparent um, with the onset of puberty, particularly in girls. Um, and that in itself, just that whole thing of, of you know, thinking you're one thing and then finding out you're another um, can be quite tricky to manage as well and quite tricky to navigate. And certainly in terms of labelling, it's much still much more palatable to have a label of dyslexia than it is to have a label of ADHD, I think. Parents still do think. There yeah. are, they're not parents, but... You know, it is still out there that ADHD is a naughty boy thing, yeah. and you know, girls don't get it. Um, yeah. And I think for the girls, that's probably the biggest disservice because they're the ones that need the help the most. We, we yeah, I remember having this conversation with you about three years ago, and it, it's sad that we're still in the same position, yeah. just around stigma and yeah, how ADHD is, is still being viewed as a, in some cases, behavioural, yeah, uh, naughty boy. Um, you know, they, yeah, it, it doesn't exist. And, and that's preventing people that actually really need to be seen and coming forward for to be assessed, not coming through. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's why we're here. We're trying to, you know, as much as, you know, we can all, all try and do our job in raising awareness and things. But I think the conversation still needs to be had. Um, but yeah, I think we're still a long way. Yeah, and I, th- I do, it, it is, there is a g- massive gender gap, sadly, still. Yeah. Um, you know, and as you know, from... Uh, your dealings with Molly, it 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 can make a massive difference, and it can be yeah. make or break. Yeah, I'll let her in. Um, it can be make or break yeah. for a young person to actually. And I think if you ask some of the young ladies we've seen, certainly Catriona would say the same. I think that actually having a diagnosis of ADHD and being able to unpick that or unpack it with myself or with Catriona or with with um, some of the ADHD coaches that Catriona uses um, is really really powerful. Mm. And Molly would say that actually having a having a label isn't an excuse but it does help her to understand why some of her behaviors are the way that they are mm-hmm. um and to contextualize it and to realize especially at a, you know at an age 13 14 where it's all about peer pressure it's all about fitting in and finding your tribe i think it's massive you know that the the label 
there is something behind the label. It's not just, you know, you're dyslexic, you're, you're ADHD, whatever it is, that there is something that goes alongside that. And I really would like to campaign for more talking therapies and for it to be more widely discussed. Is that yeah. right? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Um, Katrina, are you still there? Yes. Oh, right, okay. Uh, we, we, we've lost you on our, on our screen here. Um, I'm not sure what's happened. Uh, although we can still hear you, which is great, but uh, it's just, uh, yeah, we can't see. You. So, uh, are you able to try and log back into? I've logged back in, and I can see both of you. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, one second. I'm looking up because I, I can hear a voice, but I don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> right, let's have I a just, look. Uh, I'm just agreeing from back, and uh, to me. Very much, I get told on a daily basis again that oh, but they can concentrate when they're doing this, this, and this, so they can't have ADHD. Yeah. And again, I have to have a lot that it doesn't mean you can't concentrate. Mm-hmm. You know, if you are enjoying it and you like something, you can concentrate. It's not. It's a variable attention. It's not. Uh, uh, I, you know, you can't concentrate all the time. Well, they can watch television. They can do this, and that's you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's. A- Noma, isn't it? Uh, well, it, it goes back to the term ADHD as well, which is obviously quite misleading, which I've spoken so many times in, on this podcast around. Yeah. yeah, when people hear that, and it, it's not really capturing everything that we see with a young person with ADHD in terms of, you know, if you think about the executive functioning and, uh, you know, the emotional dysregulation, you know, just to name but a whole list of other symptoms that the term ADHD does really capture, you, yeah, you can kind of see why sometimes it's, it's quite confusing for some people. But also, you know, that notion that you're disordered, you know, which I find quite funny. But, you know, I I think I'm disordered. Maybe I am. Maybe you're going to go, yes, you are. Yeah. (laughs) More human beings are slightly off piece. So, you know, I hate living with that term. Oh, therefore, I'm disordered. And I think in America, they still call it a behavioral uh, disorder. And so I want to know what's disordered with everyone's behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, th- I think they tried to do the rename, changing the word disorder with condition, with autism, didn't they? Uh, yeah. Which is why it's ASC now. But yeah, with ADHD, I think we are where we are. But um, I was just going to ask in terms of, you know, I had a question just, you know, Luke, <laughs> my mind is just drifting off there. Um, just in, in terms of someone who is seeking a, an assessment. So for a parent, for example, they are suspecting the young person is possibly might have ADHD. They have a conversation with the school. The school doesn't seem to be supporting it. You tend to find, you know, we often hear the word masking in the school environment, yeah. and particularly if these if they're not presenting with the hyperactive and impulsive symptoms, uh, that can be easily missed. So, um, in your experience, from an educational perspective, because obviously I can comment from a clinical perspective from what I hear, from from your side of things, you know, what are your kind of experiences of seeing these young people that might present or mask their traits of ADHD in the school environment? I think first first off, there's usually a, a another issue, yeah. um, and like Katrina said, in the schools that we work at, because the kids come in at secondary, um, there there would usually be a history of some sort of need. Um, and it's usually dyslexia. Um, I have developed my own sort of way of screening um, and look at, always look at things like working memory um, because that's a massive, to me, that's a massive flag, working memory. Um, and the difference sometimes as well between verbal working memory and visual, work, you know, visual working memory, all of those things. And having a conversation and the amount of kids that have come through, I think, where just talking to somebody, bonkers as we might be, actually, and, you know, talking about one of the things, are, one of the most powerful conversations I remember saying to kids is, is or having a conversation with, with young people about is, um, and it tends to be a bit of a flag for me, is have you ever been in one of those social situations where what you think is hysterically funny and you look around the room and every, nobody else is laughing, but you're on the floor, you're in bits. And quite often, with certainly with, with um the age group that I see and teach that can quite often be the the first point of, of a conversation starter so yeah actually and have you ever done anything stupid and I always give examples and I think for lots of young people having somebody in front of them who can give personal examples of where they've got it spectacularly wrong and I'm looking at Catriona for this too <laughs> um, but that, per- that, that personal experience of something can make it so much easier to talk about and it suddenly takes away all of this fluff around it and I think then it enables me to have a conversation with parents to explore because as I said lots of parents don't want to think about their child having ADHD because the minute people think ADHD they think medication the minute they think medication they think you know drugging a child 
um, all of those things. And you wouldn't be, I would always say to parents, you know, you wouldn't be a responsible parent if you just gave medication to your kid without questioning its validity, how it might help them or not. Um, and I think just having those conversations, and certainly Catherine and I have found over the, the years we've been working together, I think that um, more we are seeing more and more dyslexia, which is actually ADHD. Um, and as I say, it's partly as a result of the screening, probably yeah. because we're both bonkers and a bit neurodiverse ourselves, um, and we pick up on it quicker. But that would be the first thing to me, would be the social stuff, certainly around teenagers, I think the social stuff and the conversations around how they might over empathize at times and get it spectacularly wrong at others it's probably one of the big ones for me mm. alongside the work you know the stuff that you normally get from teachers so the you know the disorganized never hands homework in it's always done it's always in my bag at the bottom but i just forget to hand it in right i do it because if i don't do it straight away i'll forget it yeah um but then it stays in my bag right and the sort of you know and it usually gets to to me because there have been punishments or there's been sanctions made um but rarely has an adult actually sat down with a child and said why do you think this might be? Hmm. Which is quite interesting with all that's going on and, you know, all the awareness. Yeah. Um, Cacione, have you got anything to add around like the masking and stuff that we were discussing? I do. I mean, I think girls tend to mask away more than boys. Um, I mean, I could be wrong on that. Girls are so busy trying to do as they're told. Um, you know, we obviously know, you know, their GCSE grades are generally better. Their A-level grades are generally better, not because they're cleverer, <laughs> just because that work ethic. And trying to do the right thing and do as they're told and I think a lot of the time it's sort of hidden and the effort of hiding that is is just extremely difficult for them historically we've had way more girls with an attentive type than with hyperactive type and a lot of the time and this is really pertinent with JCQ kind of govern um, access arrangements for exams the school has to notice it the teachers have to see it being a problem and these are teachers who really aren't trained in SEN issues and don't have a clue because they've probably done two days training as part of their teacher training and they'll sit there and go no we don't see a problem and they don't because you know the the child sitting in front of you or the student smiling and nodding while they're thinking something completely different and so no they don't see those behaviors which you know I would pick up on very very quickly so the parents see them at home because the effort of maintaining that in school is is so effortful the dysregulation happens at home, but we're not seeing it in, in a... Hello. Lost her again. Oh, we lost her. <laughs> uh, I think we lost you, Katriana. Uh, I'm going to try and bring you back. Uh, one second. Yeah, <laughs> The joys of I'm technology. <laughs> <laughs> we do quite well, actually, done yeah. half an hour of this. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going back to your point about the, uh, the the masking and, yeah, how that can easily be missed. So so the girls, the girls, you know, or the boys who are masking, it's generally an attentive type a lot more. Yeah. Uh, the teachers aren't seeing it because they're not trained to see it. Uh, we then have a problem with getting access arrangements in place because, of course, the student goes off to say, see you, um, and the school's form filling in is that they're perfect and there isn't a problem. And so we end up with, with this terrible, you know, issue that we can't get a diagnosis for them and we can't get uh, access arrangement support for exams. Parents do tend to see it because the student comes home, they're exhausted with the effort of masking all day and they totally dysregulate at home. So, you know, I always trust what a parent says to me as my starting point um, because I think they have a much better idea of what's happening because they're seeing this, this student in a safe environment. So I generally start by listening to the parent and the student themselves. Uh, I had one in actually on Monday who turned to me and said, no, I hide it in school because I'm so busy trying to sit on my chair and do as I'm told and not move. Um, I can't remember anything else that's going on. And, and you think that effort is enormous. I mean, I know when I'm in meetings and I have to sit still, um, I'll come up with any excuse I've got to leave. I'll get my PA to phone me halfway through. But I'm a, I'm a governor at school. They have three-hour meetings. It finishes me. And now I actually have just said, look, I have ADHD. I've, I'm going to have to go for five minutes and I'll come back. Yeah. But, you know, I'm in my 50s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the other thing with the parents as well is that sometimes I think parents, I, you know, I may be making a, a massive generalisation, but I think for some parents certainly there is also that thing of, of go, how, do you, how do you say you think there's something wrong with your child when school haven't noticed it? It's never been in their school reports. It's just, they're just, you know, that's really hard. 
And as Catherine and I have both said, we, this is something we're passionate about. This is something we're really invested in. So we do look for it and we do have those conversations with parents. But I have to say, um, with my Senko hat on, I don't know that all my colleagues are trained to the same level I am um, in terms of spotting it. And sometimes it is easier to go with, you know, the dyslexia label or the... Because actually the ADHD label and all that goes with that is, is a much bigger can of worms, actually. Because no two kids are the same. There's not there's not one way fixes everybody. You know, we talked last week about extra time versus rest breaks, and some might you know some kids it might be fine with a rest break and a prompter, somebody tapping the table. Other kids might want twenty five percent extra time because then they know that they can plan or whatever, as Molly said last week. So it is really tricky, and I think that is a big thing. And and also because it's the, because of the stigma, I keep coming back to it, but it it has to be addressed because of the stigma it can also be perceived as bad parenting. You know, your child is, is failing at school because you failed as a parent in some way, either to check the homework or to make sure. And like Catherine said, when the, when the, the dysregulated behaviour is at home, it's hard as a parent to say, actually, he's climbing the walls by the time he gets home. Yeah. And, and from a clinical point, uh, point of view as well, that, that, that's some of the challenges some, you know, my colleagues have encountered where, particularly if you think about, you know, some services like the NHS, where the criteria says you have to score on both parents' school questionnaires for us to even look at you and consider to go down the kind of screening for for ADHD. Um, and, and and I suppose that that's the dilemma that you know education and health we're in. Oh, we lost Katriona again. Uh, I, I know you still are you still on the call, Katriona? Yes, I'm still on the call. Are you still on I'm the call? Are you trying to rejoin? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, you know, we're governed by rating scales. Everything done, it has to be on paper. If they don't score, if it's below a certain score point, that's, that's the conversation that I think if you don't know much about ADHD and you don't understand around the whole masking issue, uh, that can be quite a challenge to justify why you are putting someone forward from a clinical perspective who doesn't really seem to be showing traits of ADHD uh, in, in the school environment. And also, you know, the kids that you're seeing or I'm seeing and Kat Jones seeing, the most part are through the independent sector. Yeah, it's you know if you're if you're looking at trying to get your child assessed for ADHD um, through the state sector through the, the you know the normal channels, you are looking at a wait time of of humongous. Yeah, um, you're also you know in terms of the behaviour that parents will be seeing and having to live with on a daily basis. That's huge. Um, you know, and schools just don't have the funding. They don't have the funding. They don't have the expertise mm. um, to get things in place for kids early on enough mm. to make a significant difference. I think. Yeah, I, I tell you, the factor that was was raised with me the other day at a, a local state school, they just don't have the rooms or mm-hmm. the space, so they don't want these kids, you know, with, with arrangements because they do not have the facilities to manage it. So actually, it's in their best interest that they're not raised because, say, they've got ten, you know, computers they can use, and that's it. So they don't want lots of laptop users. They don't want lots of kids with ADHD with rest breaks that they then got to manage, you know, when their exam is going to finish when. You've got an enormous year group and you've only got one room and learning support that you can actually use and two members of staff. So, you know, there are massive issues. It's then a huge cost to the school. Yeah. So they don't want it. Um, and, you know, I know, I know, you know, I am super passionate about this. I have for years sat and watched these students bump along the bottom and when they're really bright, able students. So, you know, it becomes a bit of a catch-22. I mean... Our other fact, which, you know, Karen and I worked with a student who had gone into well-being with severe anxiety. And I was stunned <clears throat> that a girl with severe anxiety then wasn't referred to to learning support. Because obviously, if they're masking, there's a high possibility of neurodiversity in there. So it should be a natural progression that a student presenting with severe anxiety would then be referred to to learning support to have a little bit of a deeper dig. I mean, it was unfortunate the student's parent was a doctor, uh, so was very unimpressed um, that it hadn't been checked out. But, you know, to me, that's, that's an absolute no-brainer. Yeah. And yet these things aren't in place because our understanding of ADHD is so poor. Mm-hmm. And I'm still told, well, educated. Well, you know, that doesn't mean you don't have ADHD. We- so you end up difficult situation we had a question someone asking on our social media around um 
uh, let me just bring up the question here. The rest breaks, because we're talking about exams and stuff. They, were, they just wanted to get some clarification in terms of how how, how that kind of looks like in, in, in terms of like how, you know, one, how do you go, well, the first question, well, the first part of the question is how do these young person utilize the rest breaks whilst in, 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 a, in an uh, exam? Is it individualized to the young person based on, um, I don't know, is it yeah. per hour, half an hour, 10 minutes? How, how does it work? It's entirely the student's, you jump in, Cab, it's entirely the student, it's up, It's dictated by the student. So they could have, in theory, um, as many or as few as they wanted. Um, and I'm going to my butt. Go on. That is JCQ says. Yeah. That is JCQ's ruling. However, most schools don't like that. So I'm, I'll give you my daughter's old school's example. They were not, and the school I used to work with the most, which is a large public school, um, not uh, the one near you. Um, but um, they used to say, student was not allowed a rest break for the first uh, 45 minutes. They were only allowed up to 25% time rest breaks. That is not what JCQ says. JCQ clearly states it is up to the student. It is up to the school to discuss with the student what they need, and they are allowed as many as they like. Obviously, for a school, that's hugely complicated, so they like to try to control that. And that is not helpful if you've got ADHD. You need a rest break when you need a rest break. You might need none but you might really need them. So again, it's the school then starts to try and manipulate the rules to suit them, which is against the Special Educational Needs and Disabilities Act because you are discriminating against disability. But most parents don't know that. So you end up with, again, an awful catch-22 that you can't take a rest break because school's told you you're not allowed to, but the regulations say that you can. Right, right. Um, yeah, the issue around rest breaks and, and also this issue around uh, extra time uh, that's another one because you are obviously they are entitled to is it 25 percent well they're not not it's not an entitlement just because you've got adhd it yeah. needs to be your normal this is what i was saying last week it needs to be your normal way of working it needs to be what you've always had experience on the ground would say that for the most part students with adhd do better with the extra time than they do with the rest breaks because of the continuity yeah. And you, you, you and I have had this discussion, and I know you've done battle with JCQ about this before. But the rest breaks, if you've got ADHD, are not helpful. Because a rest break, just for parents who are out there listening, what, what rest breaks are are stop-the-clock breaks. So what that means is you put your hand up. In reality, you put your hand up in the exam hall. Somebody comes over, takes your paper away. You then can do your movement, whatever it is you need to do, or just sit and rest. And, and for most kids with ADHD, it's, it's usually to do something to do with the, with the mobility. So it might be to mess about with their hands or to stretch or something like that, just a, a bit of a movement break. I'm realising how much I'm weaving my own arms <laughs> as I say that. But you're um, living the dream right now. Uh, so that's that's the big, that's the basic premise. But as, as Katrina said, managing that in a hall where you might have, you know, I can think of in my previous employment... Well, you might have 20 kids who've got ADHD. If they all stand up at different points throughout an exam, jumping around, stretching, whatever it is that they might do, I can understand how that would be deemed to be disconcerting for others. Equally, though, to not allow them to do that would potentially impact their exam results. So it's a really difficult one for a school to manage. Lots of schools do it um, by having a smaller venue so that kids, you know, all the kids, say, with extra time or all the kids with rest break are in the same room. So at least they're only if they're going to you know sort of um distract anybody it's within that room and it's within that smaller setting and sometimes actually just being in a smaller setting is enough and they don't then find they need the rest breaks but i think the rest breaks versus extra time parents seem to assume that adhd equals extra time actually it doesn't you as a clinician can suggest that that would be useful me as a senko it's up to me to make the decision as to whether i think that's appropriate or not and to apply it so parents out there who are thinking you can challenge it all, <laughs> be warned, I can come back and say, actually, no. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, and I think also, go, go on, Katriona. Sorry, JCQ does say that you have, I mean, and I, I do not agree with this. They say that you have to trial rest breaks for someone with ADHD first. To me, um, as someone with ADHD who's um, taught and works with endless students with ADHD, they all say that to be in a small room setting with less sensory input, because they said they noticed everyone sneezing, turning a page, you know, the teacher click clacking up and down with their shoes on. All those things are hugely distracting for someone with ADHD. They all say they would prefer a small room setting to be trialed before rest breaks. And most of them say rest breaks are absolutely useless. You know, and then other students in the room will say how disturbing it is to have somebody suddenly stand up and stretch and move around at the back. So 
you know, to me, it, it, it should be a small room setting and then consideration of what else is needed. But JCQ does say rest breaks must be trialled as a first port of call. I presume that was written by someone without ADHD, but um, it is what the regulation says. Mm. Okay, all right. And uh, if if we could try and fast forward the conversation a bit. So once, you know, the students have finished their exams and they are looking at options going forward, um, if, be it, you know, once they've finished their GCSEs, if they're going to, um, to do their A-levels, great. Uh, for some of them, they want to explore other avenues at that stage. Same applies to those students that are, considering uh once they've finished their a levels uh they're looking at um options going forward so for for adhd particularly um what advice would you say based on whatever the results that they get post a levels or gccs be very prepared about going to university all the structures of school fall away i know i started this before before we went live saying how many of my clients have dropped out of university it's quite astounding um i would be very aware of what you're walking into and get as structured as you possibly can before you go 10 hours of contract time a week that is it at most universities unless you're on a science-based course um what do you do with the rest of your time how do you plan you know, your essays? How do you get yourself motivated? How do you suddenly manage your money? And I think there's a lot that needs to be done in those summer holidays to get yourself prepped and ready um, so that you don't drop out because it's a very different place to school. I suppose you've you got the whole independence as well that comes with university. Uh, uh, it puts your ADHD symptoms to the test, really. Like Some of them move away from home, uh, you know, living miles and miles away having to live by themselves and for themselves and then you have the added pressure of whatever course you're doing at uni uh living by yourself and having to manage all the independence that comes with that that is it's obviously quite a challenge in itself isn't it it is and the student i saw today <clears throat> his big point was number one it's meant to prepare him for real life but he'd had a year out before and he um had found that you know he had to get up to work but he said uni i don't have to get up so there's a suddenly destructured 10 hours contract time a week. He was like, I can do that in a day. Then what do I do with the other six days? <clears throat> you know, I think it's a really difficult call. Um, so I do think, and, and I think the support at uni is very minimal. So I, yeah, I think you've got to be very prepped as a parent and helping them prep um, and very on it basically and staying in touch with them. Also suddenly the distractibility of all those great things that you can do. Why do your work? Yeah. <laughs> There's also a, a big thing now with, with degree apprenticeships and all of those sort of alternative ways of getting the qualifications whilst working. And certainly as a parent, that's something I've been looking at with Molly. We've been looking at how she can use her skill set and, you know, the, the fact that she likes the structure, as Catriona says, you know, not just to go in the forces, but to maybe do a degree apprenticeship where she's learning and earning, as she says, <laughs> which is music to my ears as a parent, I have to say. Um, but that sort of notion, and I think more and more, actually, you know, the, the other thing is there's no such thing as jobs for life. All of that's kind of gone out out the window. And if, you know, if we learnt nothing from COVID, it's that you need to be adaptable. And that's all the skills that universities are looking at. They're looking for the soft skills. Um, and actually, lots and lots more opportunities for children with or for young people with neurodiversity to excel in you know areas such as tech lots of the stem stuff because that really that problem solving that ability to think outside the box all of those things really play to an adhd as strengths um so looking at you know the big companies you know the dyson university all that kind of stuff it's absolutely doable um but it's doable in a different way to perhaps the way in which parents would have studied or would like to have studied um so i think that looking at the other options and schools are really good about are getting better i should say not really good getting better at <laughs> who am i kidding at suggesting those things but i think still as a parent you need to do a bit of digging and you need to be on the front foot certainly when you're looking at kids moving from gcse's to a levels what's the right subject choices you know one of the things that governed molly's subject choices and again this is a very personal thing but i thought with my mum hat on and with my teacher hat on i want her to do things which it's not going to be all exam based so courses where there might be an element of coursework, which for an ADHD is a nightmare because of the organisation, but equally minimises the stress later on of trying to cram for three lots of exams in a relatively short space of time in an incredibly high level. Um, you know, and the, and the other thing with that, with A-levels, is obviously with three-hour exam papers, um, if you're yeah. an extra timer, that's three and a half hours, so that's a long time. Yeah. You know, if you've got two exams in a day, all of those things 
massively impact. So I think thinking about things like that well in advance, and as I say, choosing, you know, it's a horrible thing to say, but choosing subjects strategically. So yes, your kid might want to be the next, you know, entrepreneur or whatever, but just because they've done a, a bad <laughs> A-level in economics is not going to make them that. They're better off doing something that's more suited to their skill set than might be. The thing about the element of coursework means they have got a sense of, I've already got 50% of this in the bag or 25% of this in the bag. It's not all riding on that final exam, which as we know, whilst most ADHDs pull it out of the bag for the final exam, <laughs> some don't. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, mitigating circumstances, I guess, and, and you know, relief, relieving the pressure or the potential pinch points by being sensible early on. How, how well equipped are some of these universities for students with neurodiversity needs? Not at all. Really? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all, really, are they? They get, they no. get you know, they, they're nominal in, in what gets offered. Some are better than others. Some do offer a one-to-one with someone. Um, once a week. Once a week. And you've got to remember to contact them and turn up, which <clears> for someone with them, just doesn't happen. You know, and it's just the stuff like the physicality of getting around a campus you and I were having this conversation and in fact we, we had this conversation last week um, and Catriona is smiling because I'm sure she's thinking the same child I am um, who went off to university and didn't know how to read a timetable so stood on the wrong side of the road waiting for a bus for an hour and a half because <laughs> nobody no adult in their life including at the university had thought to tell them that because the university campus was um, a mile and a half away from where they lived that they'd either have to walk or they'd have to get the bus well Getting a bus for somebody who's neurodiverse is, is a challenge in itself. Then throw in the sensory issues of getting on the bus when you did it when it did finally arrive. Yeah. Um, toys out of pram time, so that yeah. ten hours suddenly became one. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, so you can see how easy it is for something like that to fall by the wayside. And you know yeah. what was a really exciting time in your life just goes because all of the practicalities. Um, and you and I talked about that Chris Packham thing last week when we were saying about that one where the young man explained how it felt to be him just to get into the classroom. And I think that for ADHD is, is a massive thing because people tend to see them as happy, jolly, in a slightly different way to the way in which we see people with ASC. Um, and we don't see all of that stuff that goes on and it comes back to that masking thing. But all of the things it takes to get me on that bus, the smells, the noises, the everything. Have I got the right money? You know, Will it arrive on time? What do I do if it's early? What do I do if it's late? All of those practical skills. I think as parents, we sometimes forget... And I think probably having had kids at home as well during COVID, we may have cosseted more than we might have done. And teaching them those, explicitly teaching them those skills, take them to the bus stop, take them to the train station. Can they get from Guildford to Woking successfully and double points then get back again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Go on, Katriona. As a slightly, I mean, I'm sorry to keep coming back to sort of pragmatics and rules and law. Um, but I think, you know, the thing is, these students then have to apply for a disabled student's allowance. That means they've got to do extra on top of what everybody else is doing. Once they've done that, you know, they then got to go to another meeting. Once they've done that, then they've got to, when they get there, arrange their meetings once they're there. It's just another thing. There are layers and layers and layers of extra work that a student who has a disability has to deal with. And if you've got ADHD, you mean to do it, but you don't quite go get around to it um, I opened a printer uh, for a student the other day that they've had sitting in their uh, room for over a year because they hadn't quite got around to opening it um, you know you end up with all these difficulties notwithstanding the fact that disabled students allowances have been set up in liaison with SASC which is a group of specialist teachers they are not psychologists they do not understand ADHD or autism and yet those are the people who set up your disabled students allowance so the support that you get is based on a dyslexic student. So unfortunately, it is woefully inadequate for anyone with autism or ADHD, woefully inadequate. And the person who writes your disabled student's allowance could be a psychologist, could also be a specialist teacher who, again, doesn't have the experience or knowledge about what will be needed. So the recommendations just aren't there. And, and it's unfortunate that that's how it's been set up, but that is your reality. So the universities don't have ADHD coaches on site. You can have help for study skill support, possibly with a specialist dyslexia teacher. It's just not set up for you. Just not set up for you. Yeah, it, it sounds it sounds depressing. <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly. When you have kids at university, it's really depressing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm my son dropped out you know he makes cocktails for a living now um because he just couldn't cope with all the turning up to all these things and having to deal with meetings and all on top of more than any other student has to deal with 
And so the neurodiversity just became a massive challenge. Um, he's very good at making cocktails, though, so we're all good. <laughs> it, it honestly speaking it's a massive transition you know leaving school and and becoming an adult in itself and then let alone going to university and having to learn all about becoming an adult and then you try to juggle your course and stuff like that it's a challenge um i want to touch on in terms of another question i've just uh, seen come through in terms of what i think Carcioni touched on it briefly what training do teachers have on neurodiverse issues <laughs> as part of their tr teacher training well, there's two like, things. Like, like, yeah i was gonna say well, the first thing is in the independent sector you don't actually have to be a qualified teacher so you may well be dealing with somebody who's got no teaching quali no formal teaching qualification um and which i find absolutely abhorrent how does that again. work because that's the that's the whole nature that that's the nature of the beast in, it was traditionally in the independent sector right um, that you you could be a teacher with a, a degree and not actually have a teaching qualification. I certainly bang the drum um, in my last workplace for everybody should have a teaching qualification because I think it's important. I think it's right. Um, you wouldn't, you know. I hope nobody would rock up to a doctor and not expect him to be qualified. Um, and it is, you know, we are dealing with disabilities, and I know it's not on the same level as somebody with a, you know, with a physical injury, but it is still massive. And the impact of us getting it wrong as teachers is huge in terms of mental health, in terms of where that person, young person, ends up. Um, massive if we don't do the things that we're supposed to do. So teachers don't have to have any formal training. They get um, SEN training, and by that, that's everything. That's phonics. That's how to learn to read. All of that. Um, if you're lucky might get one or two days on that as a part of your um, QTS, as part of your NQT um, qualification and teaching qualifications, but that's it. And then it's it's entirely at the behest of either A, the school, or B, the SENCO, and what they're interested in. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm training at a local university, and I do uh, two days. Mm -hmm. And I've got to get through everything. So I've got to get through uh, reading difficulties. I've got to get through hearing difficulty, speech and language difficulty. I've got to get through you know, neurodiversity. I've got to get through everything in two days. Um, and therefore, you're going at such breakneck pace. I think I have like a slide and then, you know, 10 top tips. But you're going at such pace because you've got to deal with physical difficulty. You know, everything is in two days. And that's what the teachers are getting. And um, I don't know how you manage that when a fifth of your school group is going to be neurodiverse. Yeah. I was stuff. literally about to mention that point, that it's astonishing <laughs> yeah, the, the number of young people and you know that we see <laughs> who have these needs. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's astonishing, it's okay. really. Yeah. And that, that's where I work. I don't know if that's normal. I mean, they buy me in for two days, and that's it. And I just think this is a huge group. Um, the teachers, most of the recommendations for any of those students are just good teaching. They're kind of pragmatic, aren't they? Let them move. Let them stand up. Give them movement break. It, it's all fairly basic stuff. But, of course, they don't know because they're trying to take all that on board in two days. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, once a young person has been diagnosed with ADHD, and usually as a clinician we make recommendations and we you know, sometimes send a report and... Um, what's the obligation for the school to put these, because I know the questions come through in terms of like taking on board what's been recommended by the assessing clinician uh, in terms of supporting these young persons. Sometimes you, you get generalised type recommendations, sometimes you get quite specific recommendations, so it varies. But anyway, recommendations, post-diagnosis. So the first thing is that um, anybody who has a private diagnosis, and this is worth being aware as a parent, um, it, it's not necessarily JCQ, which is the Joint Council for Qualifications, which oversee all of the exams in the in England. They have said that an externally commissioned report um, is not necessarily admissible for exam access arrangements, for example, unless it has been commissioned in partnership or collaboration with the school. So, in that sense, there's no access for that. It's huh? a school I don't really well. They will often refuse me access and say no. Yeah. So the school have to have had. So you and I would have a conversation yeah. before you saw the student. That's that's best practice anyway. And I would hope, especially in the case of ADHD, where you want this, you know, the symptoms should be existing in the two different environments. That that the school would be on board with that. However, we do still have in the independent sector parents who do 
feel because they've paid for something that it should be actioned. Um, it's slightly trickier when, when you know, a parent has paid for private assessment because of the waiting times, for example, on the NHS to get a student seen. You know, if I if I'd waited from year nine, I think we'd still be waiting at this point now, um, and that can be quite frustrating. So I think that the, my advice to parents would be. Have a conversation with school. Don't go in there, sort of all guns blazing, waving a piece of paper and telling me what I need to do for your student, for your child. As much as you want to do that, I think what you want to do is have a collaborative working partnership with the school and say, these are the things that this person has suggested. And Catherine would be the first to say, you know, there are generic suggestions that work for an ADHD. -er. What I tend to do is say, okay, right, Archie's written this report. These are the things he suggested, or Catherine, or whoever it has been. I will sit down with the child and I will create what I call a personalised learning plan, which is where we have a conversation about which of these things you think actually really work and which ones don't. And then we revisit it. And there's no point in me putting together, sending out loads of bits of paper to teachers who are overstretched and if they had to read every piece of paper on every single child in the class, would never actually teach. You know, and one of the biggest <laughs> things that I hear from staff is, but I have got 30 kids in my class, I cannot possibly teach 30 different lessons. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to accept. And actually, one of the biggest things is if you teach well for a neurodiverse population, you will touch 90% of the people 100% of the time, um, rather than just concentrating on the dyslexic student or the student with ASC, whatever. You know, good teaching should mean that you're having to make less specific adaptations. No. But even when you do make the adaptations, that they are absolutely relevant to that child, you know. Not everybody needs a movement break. Not everybody. You could have a whole class walking around handing out books, for example, based on... <laughs> yeah, because that's one of the classic ones. Give them a movement break, allow them to walk around. Well, yeah, but I've got 15 kids with ADHD in the classroom. Carnage. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to work a out. <laughs> yeah, your turn this week. Um, and none of us will remember anyway. But it is that whole thing of, you know, so as a parent, I would say, try and go in in a, in a spirit of collaboration. It's not you against the school you have to also acknowledge that the school are up against it in terms of funding, in terms of time, and in terms of personnel and the experience of the personnel in front of you. You know, not everybody has the same level of experience. Um, and as I say, you're up against tight deadlines, you're up against, you know, EHCP students, for example, so those who are on a, a you know, a plan who have legitimate access to whatever has been laid out in that plan, and that all top trumps those who've got their independent, gone off and had their independent assessment done. So I think have a collaborative discussion with school. Don't go in on the back, you know, don't go in on the back foot, all guns blazing. And I think you'll find you get more out of it. And ask to have that conversation on a more regular basis. You might think, actually, it's only in French that the teacher really gets it spectacular. Well, we'll have that conversation. Speak to the Senko. Ask who's the best person to talk to. And it may not always be the Senko. It might be the kid's tutor mm -hmm. who has a better relationship. So have a conversation yeah. with school first. Don't yeah. go in waving paper, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Got you on that. Says she. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know what you do, Archie, but I know what I do. Um, yes, I do give them lots of top tips. I expect the parents to do as much as the school um, or more. You know, I'm saying this is a three-part process. This is the parents, this is the student, this is the school. It's not just all on the school. Um, so be realistic. Um, <clears throat> realize if you go in in an antagonistic manner you're going to be met in an antagonistic manner so go in and be collaborative supportive what can you do <clears throat> I write my reports and the first pertinent things for that student are written in bold um, it's usually about five or six and no more it's for home for school and they're the most important things and I kind of feel that if we can get those over the line because I would have discussed them with a the student concerned unless they're under the age of seven um, so normally if we can get those over the line those are the most important things and it kind of then gives the parent and the school the heads up as to these are the important ones the rest of it just as and when you know but they're not as important mm. Um, another question that's just come through in regards to EHCPs, uh, I think someone just wanted to find out. <laughs> someone just wanted to find out in terms of, uh, yeah, if uh, is, is it automatic that once you have a diagnosis of ADHD, you're entitled to an EHCP? And if you do, how, how, how does that work, the EHCP process? What's the criteria? Not every student with ADHD will require an, an EHCP. Um, and the, the, you know, certainly the local authority would be going, phew, thank goodness for that. Um, because not every student need, not every student needs the same level of support. The EHCP is there to support students who are extremely vulnerable or who have 
significant learning difficulties that are impacting on more than one area of their life so you know it it's got to be under the the definition of you know the equality act it has to be something that's impacting on your day-to-day life not just your ability to concentrate for example and that's the one that's always thrown out but it is also school can make the application for an HCP as can parents um but it is not a given that if you apply for an EHCP for ADHD, that you're going to get it. In fact, it's rarely given unless there is a significant comorbidity or co-occurrence of something else alongside that um, that would give rise to needing additional support. And that's the notion that they go by for um, what we would call SEN support, isn't it, Catherine? And the, the notion of additional to and different from their peer group of the same age. And we're talking about severe severe learning difficulties now you know i would almost sort of start to say you're talking kids who uh, score on first or second percentile um struggle to maybe attend school because their anxiety levels are so high or they've got enormous sensory processing difficulties we are talking about a severe level of need that that student has gone through the whole of the code of practice and is still failing to make progress in many ways, a diagnosis is completely irrelevant. I mean, in some cases, obviously, it's very important if the student, say, has a brain tumour or has had meningitis or something. But most of the time, we're talking about a severe level of need with profound learning difficulties, and they just aren't catching up. They're getting further and further behind. So you're looking about a student who's several years behind their peers in their learning. Um, most parents, kind of, if they don't understand that, think, oh, they've got learning needs, you know. Well, so is a huge percentage of the population. These are the most marked cases. Yeah, so it's not a case of having dyslexia and ADHD and then being, you know, being able to be put forward for for an EHCP. So we're talking, like, as you say, the severity of the their needs, and usually they would have comorbidities, like as you mentioned, uh, Karen, there, uh, and they might have autism and ADHD and maybe some sensory processing issues, speech and language. Uh, which 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 does surprise me because I I didn't I wasn't aware that it has to be that severe. I mm. thought you could just yeah. have a comorbid, uh, right. you know, depression. And the other thing about, say it's an EHCP is only valid in the in the maintained sector. It's not it you know, it's not um, unless you name a specialist independent provision in the EHCP application. It's not actually applicable to an independent school um, unless, as I say, it's an independent specialist provision. Wow. So that's worth knowing as well. So you re- it, 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 we are looking at you know a very small percentage of the population, not least because it's expensive. Um, you know to put to put a student through. I think the last time I looked, to put a student through a year of specialist provision was somewhere in the region in Surrey of 120 grand plus. So there is a huge cost implication to students having an EHCP, which requires additional support or a specialist provision. So that that's why, um, and it's frustrating and it's yeah. upsetting. But there are also lots. Surrey have put together, I'm saying Surrey, Surrey have put together a particularly um, tight package of support which they offer through a one-stop, um, which I'll, I'll pass on to you and you can put on the link at the bottom, um, which is lots of advice for parents of kids with ADHD, of kids with, with um, ASC, all of that, which is designed to help mitigate and for you to then, re- you know, for, for parents to actually feel they've got some support Um but also to mitigate for those those situations where an EHCP would not be appropriate. Um, and it is really, really hard, really hard, and as a parent, of course it is, to, mm-hmm. to make that decision or for somebody else to tell you your child's not severely disabled enough to warrant extra stuff. But that is unfortunately the way it is at the moment. Is the um, the service S A I S S? I can't remember the actual. They used to be called Parent Partnership, like yeah. years ago. Yeah, sorry, I've got an independent uh, independent advisory service. Right, right, okay. So is that so they like advocates for parents? Yeah. Like uh, okay. In um, and if parents want to know any more, they can just go on the sorry dot gov dot uk website and have a look at this send local offer which right. will give in there all of the possibilities. It's signposted for loads and loads of things. And it's actually quite well written, I have to say, um, in terms of the signposting. There are other independent charities that help as yeah. well, like NSOS or Sunshine Support or yeah, SEN Jungle. There are a lot of independent groups who will also help parents out and advise them accordingly. Um, I, I feel like for ADHD, you kind of get your diagnosis um, often. Uh, and then especially from cams and then they go bye-bye and you've got no idea what to do yeah. no idea what to do um so you know that 
seeking out support is really important. Um, finding local groups is really important as a parent, so you can actually get some skills and some strategies. Yeah, it, it's it's yeah, it's a minefield, particularly if you yeah, if it's something completely new to you and you're walking into it and you find out that yeah, it, in most cases it's literally just a diagnosis with some recommendations and yeah, that's it. So uh, you seem to have frozen again, Katriona. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we're literally right rounding things off anyway so I'm just going to sort of try and get some final words from both of you before we uh, conclude and go back to the uh, yeah original kind of discussion that we were trying to focus on or that we were focusing on around exam season that we were in <laughs> um, I'll probably start with you actually Karen uh, yeah so final words exams, students, parents final words of advice Parents, back off. Be guided by your young person. Um, be available, but don't be in their space or in their face. I think would be the thing. Make sure, if if you if you feel you need to do something as a parent, because otherwise you might feel like you're not doing anything at all. Um, go and buy all the stationery. Go and you know provide all of those things. Um, and for students, take a deep breath. And look at, and this is something Molly said last week, thinking back to her GCSEs last year. Actually, at this point, look at the, you know, if you've rag rated, for example, your subjects, so that's red, amber, green. If you've done that, look at the, the ones that are, are green. Start with those, because that's a great motivator. God, I can do that question. You know, especially if you're doing past paper questions, which you probably would be at this point in time. Um, do that, and then look at the ones that are amber. They're the ones where you kind of ish. Not 100%, but I'm ish on it. I, I kind of know what it means, and if I had to, I could probably get two out of four on it um those ones are easy to make a two out of four into a three out of four or four out of four and if you don't know the red stuff by now then personally i'd be saying well if i've got time i'll look at it but you know better to get my my adage is is completely mathematically incorrect but i always say better to get 100 percent on the 50 percent you know right. don't to worry about the rest <laughs> <laughs> and for those students once they've picked up the results and it's not the result they're expecting again what options what advice would you give them? You can, well, you can always do it again. Maybe that wasn't so. I mean, there's so many things you can do. You can, I think as a parent, we had options A, B, C, D, E, F, and all the way through. Um, but actually being positive and being upbeat about stuff in the first place and saying it doesn't matter. These are, you know, for your GCSEs, the, you may have to change your choice of A-levels and... It might be a blessing in disguise for some of it. Some of the stuff as well for GCSEs is subjects you're never going to want to do again in your life. Um, some kids absolutely hate the maths and the science. Some kids absolutely hate the English. It's one of those things. It is what it is. And the idea is that you move forward to A-levels and you choose the things you're good at and that you enjoy. And I think that's something that came from the conversation last week was doing something you enjoy. It's much easier to motivate yourself to do a subject you enjoy, even if it's tricky than something you have absolutely zero interest in <laughs> don't yeah. want to do yeah. so that would be it and you know ask around there are always options and school should on results day have somebody available for them to talk to but also contextualize it you know in the grand scheme of your life this is you know i think i worked out it was 0.08 percent of your life spent doing this exam so let's yeah. just not stress about it yeah but as i said at the beginning i'm also cup half full so <laughs> probably not the best person to ask <laughs> Uh, do, do they get any careers advice? Like, do they have someone going into the Yeah, schools? they will have had careers advice pre making. Most kids would have will already have had an idea of what they need to do. Yeah. Um, in terms of what subjects they they've chosen for um, A level options, for example, if you go from GCSE to A levels, most people would have done that way back in February half term. So that will give them a focus. Yeah. And it's sort of eyes on the prize time now. I, I would say as a parent. You know, is this something, maybe for some kids, it's a visual thing. If this is where I want to see myself. And I remember taking a photo of a person in front of um, the vet school in uh, the University of Surrey, because that's where they wanted to see themselves, and just sticking it on the mirror and saying, OK, every time you, you think, oh, I can't be bothered with this. I was being polite then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at that picture. That's where you want to be. What do you need to do to get there? And, you know, you can cry, you can have a mess of temp but you need to get whatever it was, two A's and a B or three A's, whatever it was to get in there. That's what you need to do. Then you need to get on with it. So I think having this sort of eyes on the price, having a, some sort of end goal, it's not, hasn't got to be defined, but it has got to be an end goal, something that's tangible, you know, and don't, don't, oh my God, don't as a parent make the mistake of saying you'll pay money for good grades because you could end up massively in debt by the end of it if they do really well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a top tip as well. We, we were talking about this with somebody the other day who said that they'd pay their child a £1,000 for a nine. Um, unfortunately, the child did turn out with, I think, something like six or seven of them. So, oh, wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> think very carefully. I'd start at 10 quid, if that. <laughs> <laughs> and that needs to be an A star. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, it's funny because I, 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 um, I changed the subject there. Um, took my son to this uh, splash park thing in, um, somewhere outside of the UK. And um, he's terrified of going this water slide. And uh, I made a bet with him, and I said, like, if you go onto that slide, I'll buy you a FIFA, <laughs> FIFA 23. And he, and he went on it three times. <laughs> oh, so he's into you. You've got FIFA 23, 24, 25 now. Okay. So, so, yeah, yeah I'm in debt. Yeah, there you go. Don't bet. Don't make, yeah, don't don't make, make rash debt. promises to of children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, Katrina, we've lost you on the screen. Uh, I was just going to get you to say your final <laughs> words. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just I think I would say get loads of intravenous gin but they're going to be vile to you you know they're going yeah. through a super special time so yeah. you know just find any patience that you can it's not going to last forever I have this thing and my mother always used to say to me that you know today's today tomorrow's another day so we would only ever focus on today um, you know and I think yes you've got your plan but just focus on today because if you get through that you've done really well you know, so and, and I always remember that because I live my whole life like that. I'm pretty bad at thinking about tomorrow. Um, so it's always like just get through today because then it's another day you've done. And so keep it in a really small chunk for them. You know, don't go oh, be over in seven weeks because seven weeks to a teenager is a lifetime. So it is. Let's just focus on today. Have we got it done? Lovely. Amazing. You know, here's your treat. And yeah. here's my intravenous gin. I'm so stressed. Yeah. But, you know. They are going to be very stressed and not the most pleasant people you've ever met. So, um, you know, just be patient, basically. Mm. It will be over, you know, eventually. Yeah, yeah, it feels like it's never ending, though, when, when you're going through it. <laughs> and, the thing, and the other thing to say on that is, I, as a parent, take yourself for a walk around the block. Or, But the other thing is also to focus on forward not backwards there's no point looking at what we did yesterday or what the how the exam went once it's done it's done i can't crying temper tantrums nothing changes the outcome yeah. i have given that paper and now there's nothing i can do about it focus on the next one yeah yeah absolutely makes sense guys um absolutely pleasure having you both um <laughs> i'm just making sure that there isn't any other last minute questions that's come through anyone else who has any questions uh you want to submit to um to us that we can pass on to karen and katriona you're all more than welcome to do so and we'll be able to uh forward those questions to them and uh hopefully they can contact you in one way or the other and um Look forward to uh, catching you guys um, in the next podcast of the ADHD Care Podcast, which will obviously be going live. Uh, we'll be uploading it on our usual spot, uh, Spotify and Apple podcast channels. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you in the next uh, episode where there'll be another emphasis because we're doing an exam season, preparing students uh, who are about to sit their finals. So we'll probably have another guest uh, that we'll be discussing around this matter. So uh, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Katriona. I think she's gone. Oh, she takes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought you're already oh, you're already having your dinner or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're watching the pigeon outside the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. That explains. <laughs> I'll just. I don't know if you caught what I said there. I did. Oh, great. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> You know me too well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be testing you. I, I do want to put you on the spot and say what was it I said. But yeah, anyway, I was just saying my goodbyes. And yeah, th great catching up, Katriona. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll speak you. soon. I do. Take care. Uh, bye -bye. Take care, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. bye.